All right. Uh, so we will get things started. Um, tonight is Thursday, June 18th, 2020. It is approximately 7 p.m. And this is the Exeter Historic District Commission meeting. As a um, start to this, I'm required to read the following as a preamble to this meeting. Good evening, as the chair of the HDC, I am declaring that an emergency exists and I'm invoking the privileges of RSA 91A23B. Federal, state, and local officials have determined that gatherings of 10 or more people pose a significant risk, a substantial risk to our community and in its continuing efforts to combat the spread of COVID-19. In concurring with this determination, I also find that this meeting is imperative to continue the operation of the town government and services, which are vital to the public safety and confidence during this emergency. As such, this meeting will be conducted without a quorum of this body physically present in the same location. At this time, I also welcome members of the public accessing this meeting remotely. Um, even though this meeting is being conducted with the, in a unique manner under unusual circumstances, the usual rules of conduct and decorum apply. Uh, they're going to start everything off on the meeting by taking a roll call for attendance. And this is for each member of the Historic District Commission. I'll call on you. Please state your name and whether there is anyone in the room with you um, as a roll call. And once that's completed, we will kick off the meeting. So with that said, um, Doug, please unmute yourself and uh, say hello. Is he there? Yeah, okay, I'm here. You are there I'm and you are- alone in my lonely room. All right, great. Gwen? Yes, Gwen English and I am alone in my room. Great, thank you. Curtis? You're on mute. <laughs> yeah, I'm just unmuted, <laughs> alone in a room okay. by myself, and Great, uh, having you. a little bit of technical difficulties. <laughs> no worries. I like your headset. Thanks. Uh, Julie? I am a select woman, Julie Gilman, uh, representative to the board, and I am alone. And Pam? I'm Pam Jettam, and I'm alone in this room. Great. And myself, Patrick Gordon, chairman of HDC. I am alone in my room as well. So we will get things started. Um, under new business, we have the continued, pub or continued discussion of the public hearing on the application of the IOCA Properties LLC for change in appearance, including window replacement uh, to the existing structure located at 53 Water Street. The subject property is located in the Waterfront Commercial District and it is case number 20-3. So I'd like to ask the representative presenting the application or a continuation of the application to go ahead and speak, introduce yourself and speak. Um, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Sharon Summers. I'm with Donahue, Tucker and Shindella, and I'm the attorney representing IOCA Properties, LLC. Uh, with us tonight are the principals of that company, which is Jay Caswell and David Cowie. Also with us tonight are representatives from Market Square Architects, specifically Adam Wagner and Christina O'Brien. So as you know, we were here on um, May 21st and we had a work session with this commission and we received lots of comments um, from you, which were very helpful. And since then, um, the development team has spent a great deal of time and effort um, trying to address uh, each of those comments. And Adam, when he gets up to speak, will be going over um, our various efforts in more detail. Our goal tonight is to get approval for the project as presented this evening, um, but failing that, we would like to uh, at, at least narrow the issues and try to get consensus on as much as possible um, and to then get guidance on what you're looking for us to do in terms of any remaining issues that we might not be able to reach consensus on. So those are the goals. and. Before turning it over to Adam, I just want to point out, and I hope that you have, have received this in your packets. I know I apologize we submitted this a, a bit late, but um, I do want to uh, bring your attention to the fact that we um, have obtained um, approximately 50 uh, people, if not more, 
um, of residents and business owners in Exeter, and we provided letters of those support um, today uh, for the proposed uh, uh, work that we're going to do here to the exterior of the building. And I, I say that, and I think it's important that, that we recognize that these are Exeter businesses and Exeter residents, and we hope that the HDC um, will take those uh, local indications of support to heart. One of the things that I did notice last time is that there seems to be, and perhaps this was also somewhat in, in letters to the editor and that kind of thing, but it certainly was present, I believe, last time in the public hearing as well, that um, we heard from um, a number of, of individuals who were not necessarily residents of Exeter or, or even business owners in, in Exeter. And to the extent that that happens, um, number one, we don't believe that those individuals are directly impacted by what we're proposing. And um, we would encourage the HDC to follow the lead and the, the pattern of other land use boards, such as the planning board and such as the ZBA, which is to look to having participation by members of the public who are directly impacted. And to that end, um, we don't believe that members who are necessarily outside of the, of the Exeter community are directly impacted. And so we would ask you to take that um, into consideration as you're listening to members of the public. So with that, I will um, turn it over to Adam. And um, obviously, we look forward to a productive uh, meeting tonight. Thank you. Adam, uh, one, one quick thing before you get started. I noticed uh, Julie has a hand raised. Julie, is there something you wanted to say before we kicked off? Yes, I just wanted to follow up on um, uh, Council Summers' uh, comments that uh, the, the Zoom meeting is new to us, and typically when we have a meeting, we ask the person that's speaking to uh, give us their address. And if they're not from our town, we ask the board has to agree to let that person speak. This one kind of fell through the cracks because we're new to this. So thank I you. apologize for that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Adam, take it away. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, thanks again for, for having us on tonight to present to you uh, our proposal for the Aoka Theater. I am going to share my screen here and hope all goes well when I do so. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right, so it should be a, a rendering cover page for the presentation. Excellent. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is I'm going to go through a, a series of points and, and really follow the guideline of a letter that we wrote to the commission dated June 10th, uh, written by my colleague, Christina O'Brien, who's here on the, on the call as well tonight, um, and really pinpoint some of the items that we heard from all of you and kind of go through some of the research and the response that we've come up with as a result of those. Um, I think it's, it's very imperative that you know that we were listening, we were taking very good notes and uh, we've responded to a lot of that here. And as Sharon mentioned, um, we're hoping to get your approval tonight. And uh, if nothing less, cross some of these items off the list so that we know uh, we can move past those and narrow down the scope of, of what still needs to be resolved. Um, so with that, I'm just going to quickly um, go through a couple of, of slides here uh, to get to the meat of the, the conversation. But again, here is our proposed front elevation for the building, and I will get into more detail on what has changed since the last time we presented this to you. And then the next slide is the proposed side elevation. This is the alleyway side. Uh, again, it's a little disingenuous because you'd never see this elevation this way because you're in a very narrow alley. Um, but if everything were to be peeled away, that's what the elevation of the building would look like. Next, for reference, some existing photos of the building. Obviously the one that you're most familiar with, the front of it. Um, this is that alleyway on the lower level. Uh, Main Street's actually up here. And then a couple of shots at the rear of the building, um, what we like to call the blank canvas of brick. 
Next slide. Uh, and again, we presented these last time. These are some historical photos that we were able to dig up of uh, the Ioka Theater. Uh, this one dating circa 1920, upper right 1935. We don't have a date on lower right, but I'm assuming it coincides with some horrific snowstorm. Um, so historically, we could probably figure out what that is, but if I had to guess, it's probably 40s or 50s. And again, um, both the current conditions and the original. And this brings me to the first item that we would like to talk about, which is the windows. Um, and I have your comments here in front. And uh, one of the comments was in regards to our proposal for simulated divided lights and that that might not be preferred. And it was asked that we look for an alternative. Um, and let me just uh, jump in here. So let me just bring you back to a reference point here. Existing photo, proposed, um, current window openings here, current door openings here. These would be the proposed new window openings. Uh, I kind of went through all of that in the last presentation in terms of uh, maintaining the consistency. So in regards to the, the simulated divided light versus true divided light, um, we definitely took this to heart and did some research and talked to a bunch of, of window vendors um, in this regard. And what we really came back to is the fact that the original windows, the mullions separating each of the individual panes are only about three quarters of an inch thick. And that's because you didn't need a lot of, of structure in between individual panes of glass. Um, but if you were to do that today with modern energy codes, um, let me jump ahead here to a slide. It's actually slide number 11 in the deck. Oops, sorry. Maybe I don't have that slide. Um, so with the simulated divided light, as you can see here, we have dual pane of glass so that we can meet energy code. And the simulated divided light sits on the outside of the glass and on the inside of the glass, giving that appearance. But you don't have a big heavy mullion in between. And what we found in our research is that in order to do an actual divided light, the mullion would need to go from seven eighths of an inch to almost two inches. And we felt that it completely changed the appearance of the window and that um, the simulated divided light was actually more in keeping with the, with the original aesthetic of the building. And I'll go back here uh, with these six over six windows. Uh, so as the first point of order, we would like that item to be considered that we, we do move forward with the six over six with the simulated divided light, which as I said, is, is much more in keeping with um, just the, the, the relationship of the divider to the glass um, that was always originally there. Uh, the next item as it relates to the windows is in the alleyway. And we had talked about replacing these CMU block infills with some new windows. And after much consideration, we're actually gonna propose that those get infilled with a glass block. Um, from a functional standpoint, we don't want them to be fully transparent anyway. Um, and we believe that the glass block will tie in nicely with the masonry. Uh, it'll bring natural light into that lower level, um, but you can avoid any security concerns with um, it being down in that alleyway. Um, as I click through these, again, I wanted to, to go in simulated divided lights. The actual dividers are about seven eighths of an inch thick. Um, we're proposing a, um, a brick mold here with an exterior colored finish in pebble gray with a, with a wood finish on the interior. The next item I'd like to talk about is doors. And one of the, whoops, sorry, I'm scrolling on the wrong screen here. Um, one of the items that I'd like to talk about in regards to the doors was a comment that was made that um, 
It, it was your preference to see the doors maintain a symmetrical design at the lower level. And if you'll recall, what we had proposed previously was putting in a three foot panel on one side and then have a smaller panel on the other side. So we've gone back in and looked at the plans, looked at what we needed for egress. And what we're proposing now is that the main door gets replaced with a full three foot wide door with some small side lights. And these side doors maintain the original appearance of the openings, but that they are no longer operable doors. These would be fixed. Um, so again, they'd maintain the appearance, but not the function. And we felt that allowed this to maintain the symmetry that you were looking for on the front facade. Um, one of the other comments we heard was in regards to the, the position of these doors relative to the front facade. As you can see, some of these are set quite a ways back in. And uh, we've determined we're gonna be able to match that. Um, and so that, as far as the original appearance is concerned, we will be able to maintain. Uh, here again, the doors themselves would, the dividers would be simulated divided lights, matching with the windows, get consistency across the board. Uh, let's see. All right, the next comment we received was that the stair access at the roof looked large and heavy. Um, and I don't know if I have a, a, better, a better view of this. I may have it somewhere in the deck and we can come back to that if needed. Um, but really what that did is it prompted us to think about this roof area and what exactly we're doing with it. Um, if you'll recall, we had, we had previously shown the actual stair access uh, as a red color, possibly brick. Um, and that I think is part of what made it appear so heavy. Uh, but what we've done here is taken that stair access and tied it in with a roof pergola and started to establish some roof design elements. Not necessarily a green roof, but potted plants, some greenery, that sort of thing to really make this a nice space and a nice amenity for the folks that are, are living in this building. Uh, one of the other things we talked about is being able to screen mechanicals, um, looking at where vents come out the sidewall of buildings. And in looking at that, we're pretty sure we're going to be able to bring all of our vents, which would include bathroom exhaust, dryer exhaust, um, all of that. We're going to be able to bring that up through the roof. So you're not going to see those things on the facade. Uh, and I think that's very important to maintain. Um, and with the front parapet that's on the building uh, located right here, all of those things will be screened from the street. Um, they won't be visible. So with that, we created um, an additional rendering showing this rooftop pergola, um, having some greenery up there. Again, if you'll recall the back elevation of this building uh, we were proposing to move to remove the bump out um, and put in new window and door openings and add new balconies here on the rear overlooking the river. Uh, sorry, just bouncing back and forth between notes. All right, so the next piece is the canopy. And um, obviously we had a lot of discussion about this last time and we're expecting we're gonna have continued discussion about it tonight. Um, as you recall, uh, we presented this as the original Ioka Theater building, the sign which was just posted off the building and a canopy covering the main door. Um, because the function of this building is proposed to be changed, the necessity of a marquee for this building is really no longer functional. Um, and I know that's something that's been near and dear to the, the hearts of uh, Exeter residents. Um, 
but we had a we had a sign uh, company come out and take a look at the existing Ioka Theater sign, and their their opinion of it was that it was uh, in pretty rough shape, uh, and that he did not feel that uh, the fastening of the sign to the building um, was was suitable for today's building codes. Um, so at the very least, uh, the sign, in all likelihood, needs to be come down, come down and completely be rebuilt. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is just the functionality of it. And as I, as I said, the proposed use of this building doesn't necessitate having uh, a marquee. Uh, and the letters, as, um, as a iconographic as they are, um, block the windows on the second floor. And you can see just a little, a little bit of that here. Um, and this was something we talked about. Um, so one of the items we're proposing is to just go with a very slender new canopy over the front door uh, that would have these tie back rods similar to this design. This is not an image of the Ioka, it's just a, a stock image. Um, and the next slide here, I have other examples of really what we're looking to do. So um, thin canopy, eight to 10 inches tall, tied back to the building, uh, located over the front door. Then it comes to the letters and, and the, the iconography of the Ioka sign. Um, as I stated in the last presentation, this was the original sign posted off the building. Don't know exactly what year it was replaced, but it was long enough so that most of us don't remember it. Uh, this is the sign that most people recall when they think of the Ioka building. And, and as I mentioned, the marquee no longer serves a purpose and the letters are very much blocking the windows uh, and their new function. But what we would propose to do is actually remove a set of the letters and locate it on the front of the building. And, and I hope you'll find that that is a, uh, it's a salute to, to the iconography of that sign and what it has meant to uh, Exeter's identity for all these years and really let that be something um, that stands out on the front of the building. Now, we have looked at a couple different color options because one thing we've learned through the photos is that the color that the letters currently are is not the color they've always been. Um, we actually found an older photograph that the colors at one point were red. Um, so we're certainly open to, to talking about what color the letters are. Um, certainly you get more contrast if they're lighter, less contrast if they're black, but they would match the canopy. Uh, so that's something, something we're interested in talking through with the, the commission. Uh, and with that, I just want to show you again where we are so here's the existing facade of the building in photograph and in drawing here is the proposed facade in rendering and drawing um uh, where's my next slide again side elevation existing proposed um, and again, you'll never get this view because the alleyway is only a couple feet wide. Um, the opposite side of the building, which shares a party wall with the next building over. So on this facade, it's really just replacing these two small windows with three double hung windows and adding the decks on the back. Again, the rear rendering of what we're proposing, the decks, the lower deck here, uh, residential decks above, pergola, green stuff, railings to protect people, etc. And finally, I will leave you with the rendering of the front facade as proposed this evening. We thank you for your time and look forward to your comments. Thank you. All right, thank you, Adam. 
Um, so I do want to say thank you for the detailed response. Uh, it's really nice to see how each item and was addressed and itemized so that we can really have a, a meaningful conversation and be as efficient as possible about it. So I do appreciate that. Thank you. And for the completeness of the application that you have given to us um, in terms of all of the information that we typically um, have to pry out of uh, applicants to receive. So thank you very much for that. Uh, what I'd like to do is maybe go through each of the bullet points uh, with the commission members and give them the opportunity to speak about, about them. Um, so let's go ahead and let's start with Curtis on the item number one, which was the simulated divided lights. Give you okay. your thoughts, comments on that. Oh, well, I actually appreciate the energy efficiency of the um, of the proposed window. I really would like to make a correction, and I don't believe that the IECC applies to uh, historic buildings. The energy code just doesn't apply. <laughs> um, secondly, um, is there a fire rating to the side windows? And is that why you're proposing glass block? Mr. Chairman, would you like a response now? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Um, so uh, on the first point, um, that is absolutely correct. Uh, the IECC, the International Energy Conservation Code, in the first couple pages of the document states that if... Um, if you are in a historic district on a national registry um, or are capable of being added to one, uh, you do not need to follow the, the requirements of the guidelines. That said, our client has expressed a lot of interest to us in terms of making a very energy efficient building here. Um, so it's a, it's a fine line between uh, what's the best thing to do for the environment and for sustainability uh, and balancing that with uh, what should be done from an historical standpoint. So we do recognize that um, there's a balance there and um, the commissioner is absolutely correct that we are not subject to those requirements. Uh, the second piece in regards to um, fire separation of the two buildings, um, we haven't actually run all of the calculations of allowable window percentage. Um, based on the separation of the two buildings. That's a calculation which we will need to run very promptly. Um, the uh, glass block certainly helps us in some regards to that, but when you run those calculations, you have to do it by individual floor level. So it potentially would help us on that lower level, but doesn't necessarily help on the upper levels. Um, so it's a it's a very astute point and something that we will be considering. Um, but from a functional standpoint, we want natural light into those spaces. We don't necessarily need direct visual into those spaces. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we chose the glass block. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wagner. Um, I support your decision on the choice of windows. I think the sim simulated divided light is the correct choice in having a current window in the building. I just wanted to make sure that we all are all on the same page with what it, the code requires. Um, second point is I see that you have um, uh, on the rooftop, you had condensers on there or look like a condenser field that was up there, condensing units. Is there a common ventilation system for the building, a central ERV or something? Specific to the retail spaces and the common spaces, Curtis? Uh, under commercial code, you're going to be required to provide ventilation, but residential, you could get away with the window. I'm the uh, mechanical ventilation code is not my strong point. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Sure. Um, so we, we have not completed the full HVAC design for this building yet. Um, in all likelihood, the residential units will be served with um, electric heat pump units, which include a 
an electric furnace in the unit and a condenser up on the roof. And that's how you can get your heating and cooling. Um, the benefits of such systems are that they've come a long way since the electric heating systems of the 1970s and 80s. Uh, and it's a system that does not require any fossil fuels to run. Uh, so from a sustainability standpoint, it is being looked at very favorably. Um, as, as for the commercial units, um, we're not entirely sure what those functions are going to be yet. Um, you know, are they office spaces? Are they retail? Are they a combination of both? Um, and so those mechanical systems will need to be designed once we have a better understanding of that. Uh, we will need to get fresh air from somewhere. And our sense is that we've got enough roof area to work with here that we can get some shafts to go down and supply fresh air into those spaces. Um, and, and that you won't see those from the street. Okay, that's my point was that wherever that larger mechanical unit, because we know that these um, ventilation units can be five, six feet tall sometimes, that that is located back from the edge so we don't see it from the street. Um, my final point is regarding the, the marquee in the front, and I appreciate that there is an effort of preservation of the existing IOCA letters. And I'm just wondering if we could consider a possible other location of putting those on top of the two side canopies. You have the center canopy and the two side canopies. You could even have those at a slight angle so that became something that um, started to represent that angle that used to be there rather than attaching it to the, to the side of the building, but those could be floating right on top of the canopy. And I would see that as an appropriate reuse of the historic preservation piece that you're trying to do. And lastly, are you replacing the brick around the front entry that was a yellow brick with a red brick? Go ahead, Adam. Okay, I was just making sure I wasn't on mute. Um, so no, it's not our intention to replace that. I think this um, this rendering does a, doesn't show it very well. Um, I believe it's actually more of a gray color. If, uh, it doesn't show up in, it was shown, it, I had a photo in the previous presentation that showed it a little better. And, and what the gentleman is talking about is at the front door, there is a different color brick uh, than the red brick you see um, in the field. Um, our, our hope is that we're going to be able to use brick off of this building to repair and replace anywhere that we are disrupting other brick. Um, certainly if we don't have enough stock to do that, we're gonna have to take careful consideration of matching that brick and we would, um, we would assume we would be uh, comparing notes with the commission uh, on that brick selection when that time comes. But for right now, our, our hope and our goal is that we do have enough brick on site that we can use to repair and replace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wagner. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Um, let's go to Doug. Doug, if you'd like to call out by the number of their response, item one, two, three, I think through nine, I believe. Um, and go ahead and okay. speak, to, speak to your comments. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, number one, uh, simulated divided light windows. I just don't buy into his uh, presentation on that. Uh, it's a personal, I, I think it's an aesthetic decision. Uh, I don't think that the energy element is that substantial. There's not that much many windows here. Uh, and also in your letter of June 10th, you suggested having uh, actual divided lights on the lower level and then simulated divided lights on the upper level. So you've, you've changed what you, uh, what you promised in this letter. Uh, Item two, uh, the front entry doors, and, and I would say the whole facade, I think, is wonderful. I think it's uh, much better urbanistically than the original building. I think that design as you have it with the flat uh, sign and the canopies are great. 
and uh, the added windows, I think, really make this building fit in uh, to its surrounding buildings and the other it looks like it belongs it doesn't look like a strange element uh as as the theater necessarily had to be uh so uh the front windows cement the front door is symmetrical design i think it's great i'm not sure that you have to make the uh, side doors to the two doors uh, on either side of the front door inoperable i possibly they could be uh French doors that wouldn't be egress doors. Uh, I hope that you continue with, I really do believe that having the uh, canopy uh, connecting all three of those openings on the front really helps to organize the facade. And I like what you're doing on the, uh, the side canopies as well. I think that that's, that's really great. Uh, the stair on the roof, uh, it never bothered me, but I think that your whole roof uh, garden concept is great. I hope you can afford to do it. I think it's one of the things that would make me consider living there. Uh, uh, so I, I think that's a good response. Uh, item number three. Item four, front entry doors should be set back. I think that uh, someone... Uh, I think it was Patrick uh, mentioned that the original doors and windows were set back in, and uh, we discussed that, and I think you agree with that. And we discussed the idea that you would give us some details of the uh, the window uh, jams and sills heads uh, when you get further along to see how that's all going to be waterproofed and so on. But um, I think having the windows set in really does I mean, the building, it, it, it could be a very flat building, and I think that that's a problem with a historic building. Historic buildings, buildings from this period don't tend to be flat. Uh, they tend to be punched openings, and I think that accentuates, having them sucked in would accentuate that. Uh, laundry bathroom, not number five, laundry bathroom, kitchen vents. Uh, I think that's an important detail, but as you say, you're not going to know all the answers to that until later on. So hopefully we'll keep a little bit of oversight as we go ahead with that. Uh, okay, so some six is the cut sheets, but I think it's just, it's not really the, the cut sheets are good, but I think we're going to want to actually see your details, how you fit those standard manufactured windows into those openings and how you waterproof them. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And I, and I assume there's good ways and bad ways. Uh, site visits, yeah, I, I'd really like to see that. I'd really like to see this building if, if you give us an opportunity. Uh, I think it's a, it's a really interesting project. And in terms of the marquee, uh, not having grown up in Exeter, I don't have any uh, nostalgic feelings about it. I, I, as I said earlier, I think that the, taking the original, uh, uh, the original letters and restoring them, that are taking one side of them and then restoring them and putting them on the side of the building, I would hope that you also looked at restoring the lighting uh, that's embedded in those. Uh, I think that's a good solution and it retains, so, and, and, and that sign, it's not just the historic issues of that sign, that sign is the brand for your building. I mean, that's, that's the thing that really distinguishes this as a unique space. And I think it's something you're gonna want uh, in some way. And uh, I, I agree with the uh, citizens pe uh, petition. I think that there's a, a lot of uh, support for this project in the community. And I think that, uh, I sympathize with the people who do have that nostalgia, uh, but I, I'm, I'm more, and again, it's just as a, a personal issue. I, I'm, I'm more in sympathy with the, uh, the people that signed the petitions. Uh, finally, the arch, existing arch canopy can be made nicer. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's always true, isn't it? Uh, so yeah, we'll watch you as you go ahead with the design. But. In general, I, I don't have any big issues except I, I'm not happy with the uh, simulated divided lights, and that may just be my own pet peeve. But I, I worked on some historic buildings for major institutions, and they don't do that type of thing. So, uh, and I don't think it is an energy issue, even even if this were uh, covered by the energy code. I think it, there's a lot of ways to still make it a very energy efficient building. Uh, 
Okay, and and I'm not convinced that that you have to have big fat millions with that kind of window. So that's all I have to say, and I'll I'll uh, I've said my piece. <laughs> Thank all right. you. Right. Th thanks, Doug. Um, go to Julie. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm going to respond to number one is similar to uh, Doug's comment that in the letter it says the first floor level will be uh, tr uh, true divided light, whereas uh, and above that the simulated divided light and I was okay with that given that the majority of the people are going to see a true divided light window as they walk down on the sidewalk. So I, 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 if I understood you tonight, that's not what you're proposing anymore. Um, the, and if also if I understand, so you have the front door, which you very nicely um, made symmetrical with the side lights, and then the two doors on either side of that are inoperable. Is that correct? Yes, I believe so, fixed panels. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question, which is not in our purview, but I will be asked about it out on the street. <laughs> that if uh, if the uses on those front spaces, and I realize you didn't say you don't know what they are yet, if they're retail or office space or you know something in between, um, are are those doors maybe in contention for being operable? You can Adam, do you want to speak to that sure. <laughs> or not at this time? No, no I, I, again, well, whether whether the owner knows who's going into those spaces at this point, he has not shared it with the design team. Sure. Um, so we are looking at it purely from a, uh, a code compliance for ingress and egress standpoint. Um, the challenge with those openings is that they're not a full six feet wide. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have a door, it needs to be three feet per ADA. Um, and so depending on how the interior gets broken up. Adam, you froze up on us there. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. uh, wait, the last thing we heard was six feet wide. All right. So so those openings are not, are not six feet wide, so you can't get two three-foot openings. Um, right. And so... Depending on what happens on the inside, um, we might be able to make them operable from an egress and ingress standpoint, um, just based on the information we have now. Um, in in an attempt to keep the symmetry, um, we have proposed them be fixed um, because when it comes to the code, it's determined how many points of entry do you have into the building and out of the building and the total number is part of the determinant for how many of those need to be accessible entries sure. so by taking them out of off the list um, it reduces the total number of handicap accessible entries we need into the building yeah i have no problem with them being inoperable i just wondered if uh, you know if the next time we see it that's going to change yep. uh, so okay there's that um, I like the solution and number three, the stair access to the, uh, to the roof looks too heavy. I like that solution, um, depending on the color you use, it, it won't be visible from the street. It will be visible from the, um, the riverside, but I appreciate the garden aspect that you're giving the trellis and the garden aspect, <laughs> which ironically, there is a tree growing out of that roof for a long time. So you're going to put trees back up there. <laughs> Just be careful. <laughs> Um, the, I think the other, the, um, the letters, the IOPA letters, I really appreciate uh, maintaining those, keeping those and, and as a piece of the history. Um, I'm not sure about the location yet. I don't, I'll have to think about that if I, if you'll give us the time. I'm not sure what our, what our schedule is on this. Um, I was looking at the one picture that has the white car and the red car in front of it. Uh, where is it? And you can see the corner of the building that goes down that short or narrow alley. 
And further down on Water Street is a similar situation where there used to be a, um, an auto garage and it was painted, the advertisement for the garage was painted on the side. So you see it as you drive down Water Street in one direction, but you don't see it driving in the other direction. But I, so I just thought, I don't know, I don't know what the view would be from Water Street driving through if you put the letters actually on the side of the building instead of on the face of the building. So that's a consideration, if I've made myself clear. <laughs> and then I would like to talk about the, the rear of the building, but I think um, that might end up being a longer conversation. So I'd like to let the other members talk about the things that we've already discussed. So thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, may I, may I sure. just address one point? Um, sure. The, the last two commissioners have both brought this up. Uh, I, the letter we provided did state that we were looking at doing um, actual divided lights on the first floor with simulated divided lights on the upper floors. They're absolutely correct that that's what our letter stated. Um, the reason for the switch and the reason why I want to bring this up is we're not we're not trying to play any games here in terms of what we submitted and what we're presenting here tonight. Um, after we submitted that letter, we did get further information back from the window supplier that we were looking to work with on this project. And that's where we found out that the dividers would go from three quarters of an inch to two inches. And we felt that that would create a different aesthetic between the lower level and the upper level. And that's why we've presented it that way tonight. So I just wanted to put that out there for clarification. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Pam, would you like to give your comments? You might be on mute. I cannot hear you. Is Pam here. All right, let's jump to Gwen. Wait, wait, is that right? Oh, there you go. There you go. All right. Well, uh, it's because uh, I actually agree with, I mean, I love what you have done. I think you have done a lot of work. I think the windows are just fine. I'm the one that complained about the roof, and I think you did a great job on the roof. I assume from my picture that that pergola has a sort of a lattice top. Is that what those little lines mean? That is correct. So that when there's a nine foot snowfall, it's not gonna just lie there? No, it falls, falls right through the boards. Okay, thank you. And um, I do like what you have done with the having the Ioka down the side, the way it was at the, see, this is pretty much what it was at the beginning when they had the Ioka sign. And I think saving those letters is just lovely. I really appreciate your saving the Meyer building because I was afraid that was going to go. And I don't mind at all about the marquee. I'm, not that attached to the marquee and it's always looked as if it was falling down. I would like you, when I, I mean, this is a wonderful little, uh, I'm not quite sure what you call it, an overhang. But when you're picking your overhang, did you see a picture of the original overhang that was very fancy and thick and uh, Victorian iron? Did you get, yeah, see, I'll see how that, I'd like it to be more like that than, you see, you have a nice sleek modern one there. And I, I like this, but there again. And other than that, I really don't have anything to say other than to thank you for saving a building, which looked as if it was going to go right down into the river. All right, thank you, Pam. Uh, Gwen, would you like to share your comments, discussion points? Thank you. Um, I, I would like to uh, just say, along with everybody else, that I think you've done a wonderful job on this. I am, I am really impressed by how this building looks. Um, I, have, I have mixed feelings about the windows. I'm, I, I would love to see them um, not be simulated divided lights, but, um, but on the other hand, and I don't know enough about windows to 
um, talk with any authority on this, but um, as a sustainability person in Exeter, um, if if what you're proposing uh, offers more uh, more energy efficiency in the building, I'm all for that. And it it appears that the windows you are proposing are are good looking windows. I, I I too was hoping that there would be. Um, that you wouldn't have simulated windows uh, and doors on the bottom level, but um, I, I, I understand why you're going the, the way you're proposing to go at the moment. Um, while we're talking about the first level, I just have a question, and this is kind of along the same line as, as Julie's comment, but um, I was looking at this the other day and, and thinking, well, this is your poss possibly going to have retail space on the first floor and typically with retail space, you are offering um, window display areas and, and places so people can walk by and see um, what kind of retail operation you're having here. If, if that's indeed what you're, what will end up going in those spaces. And I'm just, I'm just curious, it's more for my curiosity. I just didn't know if that had been talked about and, and how the owners are feeling about that. Um, it, it's, just, it's kind of hard to sell a product when you can't, you're not inspired as you're walking down the street, you can't see anything the way it is now. And I, I, I just would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I, I'm in agreement with with pretty much everything everybody else has said. Um, the marquee, uh, I mean, I do have some. I haven't been in town that long. I I I love I love what it has done in its kind of bringing community together and advertising things or announcing things that are happening in town. But I certainly don't see that that having a marquee the way it has been is practical or would look good on this building. Um, and I, I, in some ways, I would love to see a, a blade sign, um, just because I think it adds another dimension, kind of like your um, the overhang over your door. But I don't know, that may get too complicated because you really couldn't use the letters that are that are on the current marquee because you'd only be able to see it from one direction. You'd have to have new IOCAs on printed on both end, both sides of the blade sign, which so probably would get into a, a considerable expense. I'm not sure. So I'm still trying to think about the the IOCA, but I, I I think it's nice that you are proposing it to be on the building somewhere. Um, and then one just quick question, and, and forgive me, it's probably on the plan, but on the upper level, um, on the rooftop, what kind of um, a railing do you propose just for safety features around the, the top? Um, it looks like there is, I can see something there, but I just, it's hard for me to tell what it is and if it goes around the entire rooftop or it's just around where the pergola is. It looks like it goes a little past that, but I just would like an explanation on that. But otherwise, I think it's 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 great. And I love that this building is getting new life. And um, I think you've done a terrific job. And I, I think that's all I have at the moment. Thank you. All right, thank um, you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'll touch up on the uh, latter first and the former next. Um, so the railing system would go all the way around. Um, it's going to have to be a railing system that passes the four inch sphere test, um, which is just a, a building code so that a child can't fall off the roof. It will need to maintain the, the proper height requirement for a guardrail, which is 42 inches. Um, so all of that is probably not perfectly depicted in this, um, but we're looking at some sort of a, a lightweight probably painted black so it kind of disappears into the background and that is how we would address the railing system okay uh, um, i just Which i want to touch on this this retail component and it was mentioned um about kind of retail storefront windows and certainly if we were designing this building brand new the entire first floor would be glass um but that really isn't appropriate for this building 
And so um, we're actually maintaining all of the existing openings. And one of the thoughts is that if these spaces do become retail and these do become inoperable door openings, this is at least some component of display for the retailer, um, both on this side and this side. Again, I don't know for certain if those are gonna be retail or commercial office or something in between, um, but that's, that's kind of what you get when you're dealing with a, with a historic building like this. Um, and if a retailer wants to be in there, that's part of, part of the deal with being a retailer at the IOCA. Adam, this is, this is David speaking, one of the owners. So that is exactly what we're intending is to have the private door to the different stores and the two fixed doors would be the windows for the storefronts, just as you described. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And we assume that there would be a future application for signage for those retail spaces on the exterior then? Yes, if that's what's required, then that's what we'd need to do. Okay. So maybe um, in the next iteration of the application, just a, a proposed location of where those may be in the future, because that'll ultimately impact the whole visual representation of the facade. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Commission members. Um, I'll I'll speak to my uh, my comments, uh, starting with the the first one, the simulated divided lights. Um, uh, I did like the response of having the authentic divided lights on the on the bottom and having the simulated divided lights on the upper stories. That seemed like a a, a fair compromise in that respect. Uh, looking back to that proposed elevation, if you could, Adam, bring that up for us. Uh, the line work or the the line work is fine. Um, so on that first level, uh, you really have all doors. Uh, you've got two very small windows that could certainly be authentic divided light and single pane, and not um, be a such a hot flashpoint for any energy efficiency coming out of those two small openings. And then above have your more energy efficient simulated divided lights. What I what I would recommend on the simulated divided lights would be to add the spacer bar and not have them without the spacer bar between the glass. That simulated divided light with a spacer bar makes it appear as if there is a true mullion that goes all the way through the window. Um, so I'd, in, in your cut sheet, I think it was slide number seven. You, oh, maybe not this one. Sorry, nine, yeah, right there. You can see wood SDL with spacer bar. There we go. That's That gives you the representation of the authentic divided light. If you look at the simulated divided light um, image that's to the left, that does not show the spacer bar in there. Right. Yes. So with spacer bar, uh, a lot more um, simulating authentic, I, I would say. Um, and then oh, I would double check the mullion thickness that would be required and what is available for commercial doors. I don't believe even the seven, seven eighths mullion is available on a commercial door from Marvin. Um, it may have to be larger than that already. And if you're, if you're already doing a larger mullion on the doors, which is the majority of those openings on that first floor, then you may want to consider uh, looking at the authentic divided light. At that point, if the energy efficiency of those spaces is not as big an issue because they're going to be retail, then you could still have single glass and you can still have um, you know, laminated glass or something that will provide a little bit of energy efficiency and not compromise on, on the total uh, loss. Having laminated glass down there would not be a bad thing either in terms of security purposes for, um, for the retail spaces. And if a single pane was to be... Um, broken you could replace the single pane instead of the entire door panel so just things to think about for first floor authentic divided light um jumping to uh, number two uh, the symmetrical doors thank you for that i think the, the new design looks great in that respect um i would ask the the doors that flank the center that are the fixed panels now the the side 
the side styles of those doors look, seem to be very thin, almost matching the side lights of the center panel as opposed to the door panel itself. So I think that I think it might be misrepresented. The, those would look like more true door panels, uh, similar to the existing photo. Is that correct? Yeah, we can take a look at that. I don't know why that's showing up that way. It may be that they're pocketed back in behind the brick. But. Yeah, that, that could be on the sides in the center. They would probably show us a, a heavier mullion. Uh, it looks like they just match the proportions of the side lights, which would be fixed glass, the side lights. Um, so that is just a question there. And then speaking to the recess of that, the um, the ADA compliant door is an outswing door coming out into the public right of way. is And that's required for egress to be exiting the door swing in the path of egress, right. I assume. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. And so you've kind of, you've moved it in as much as possible within that given opening. Um, I guess uh, there, there is still a transition from interior to exterior of about three inches or so that would have to be ramped in some way. So it may, may actually work to, to move it to be even in plan with those other two flanking doors to be able to help you with that transition to the exterior. Uh, just a thought. Uh, let's see. Going to uh, number three, uh, thank you. The stair access looks a lot better in terms of its proportion. Uh, I did a, have a question. Do you have a rendering down Water Street from the west that shows the elevator overrun as a mass? Or if that's even visible from that area? We don't. Um, this is in, in elevation. This is the elevator overrun right here. Okay. Um, so it's it, pretty much unseen. Yeah, it's enough to get the hoist beam in and then to get a proper roof structure over the top of it. But okay. it's not, it, it'll pop up a couple of feet tops. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, number four, we just addressed. Uh, five, six, and seven are all good. Um, number eight is the marquee. Um, so it sounds like uh, so far a lot of our commission members are, are in favor of the, the proposed design that's here now. And I do appreciate uh, providing the names of support, the 50 plus names of support. Um, I just wanted to make sure the commission members and all all others listening are aware that 60 residents of 14,000 300 as of 2010 census is less than 1% of the population of Exeter. So though, it, though it does speak to the people that, that our people are in support of that. Um, I just want to make sure that it's not necessarily any majority or even close to a representation of the whole population of Exeter that may uh, still have some sentimental value attached to that, that marquee. Um, and, and, and with that, um, the marquee as itself, thinking about uh, serving as uh, of what it, what it is doing for the building as an adaptive reuse. Obviously, we we are very much in favor of a historic adaptive reuse. We understand that not every building as it is historic can be preserved as a museum, um, and so we are very much in favor of adaptive reuse. Um, that said, the the community. Uh, and the way that that marquee has been used in the past in terms of advertising community events and things like that does serve a larger portion of the community itself in those uh, particular functions. And I would just re reiterate again, thinking about um, what that does as a service to the community and being able to uh, provide those messages and provide that iconography of Exeter itself with the IOC marquee. Um, just to think about that in terms of serving the, the entire community um, in lieu of uh, a few residents of uh, the new the new residents of the building of the Ioka, uh, the Ioka. and similar similar questions have been um, 
applications have been raised in other areas of New Hampshire itself. And there is definitely an iconography in in the marquees that are in our state. Um, for example, the, the Strand Theater in Dover, New Hampshire. Um, also, the Colonial Theater, which has almost an identical uh, marquee to the, the ex- to Exeter in Keene. New Hampshire. Um, also the Palace Theater that's in Concord. I believe it's either Concord or Concord or Manchester. Uh, Manchester. Uh, so there definitely is a, a language of that architecture existing within um, New Hampshire itself. So uh, again, I would think about um, really taking, uh, trying to trying to keep that all in consideration uh, for for the removal of the marquee completely. I uh, appreciate the report that was done. Uh, and it, it looked as though, and from the reports, considering the age of that marquee, it's not really in that bad a shape at all uh, for, for what it has endured to date. And sounds like that, uh, you know, a lot of the connections back to the existing building are necessarily more of the issue in terms of being up to code, which is completely understandable. Um, but those are, those all, all can be remedied uh, fairly easily. So um, yeah, again, we, we are stewards of the Secretary of Interior Standards for Historic Preservation and our goals and our purview is basically to try to uphold historic structures and the preservation of historic, of historic structures as much as possible. And, and to, to speak to that, um, I have one piece here. So, uh, let's see. So from the, the standards of preservation from the Secretary of Interior Standards, a property will be used at it, as it was historically or be given a use that it maximizes the retention of the dis- dis- distinctive materials, features, spaces, and spatial relationships. Whereas treatment and use may not have been identified, a property will be protected and if necessary, stabilized until additional work may be undertaken. Um, the replacement of intact or repairable historic materials or alterations of features, spaces, and spatial relationships that characterize a property will be avoided. And that, so those are, those are the guidelines that we as our guidelines that we have adopted and, and, and created for our own historic guidelines are based on the Secretary of Interior Standards. So um, again, uh, I guess if I haven't beat the drum loud enough yet, please uh, look at that and, and reconsider uh, the community as a whole for that um, preservation of that existing marquee. Um, um, with that, I believe I've said my piece. Those were the comments that I had. Um, so I will look to see, uh, Julie does have her hand raised, so I will Um, say go ahead Julie yeah I'd just like to remark that the examples that you gave of theater signs that are iconic to the theater buildings that they're in are still being operated in some kind of performing performing arts way and this is not in any way going to be the same kind of use Um, so to me in going with the Secretary of Interior Standards because we've moved so far away from that, not um, trying to rehabilitate a theater into a theater or rehabilitate a theater into something, some kind of performing place. Um, this use is so different. And, and I think that most of us have agreed that um, it just can't operate the way it historically did. I mean, there have been attempts to make this happen and it hasn't worked. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with the marquee uh, going. I, you know, I've seen it all my life. I've seen every movie that ever played there, but um, you know, like it was not the original and I don't want to replicate the original. Um, and it, it never seriously fit to me, the proportions of that building. So in, in my opinion, losing that particular marquee, but saving a piece of it and still using it to identify the building, um, I think is a uh, mitigation. Um, it may not be as big a mitigation as you'd like, but I think that we should consider that. The other thing that about uh, marquee or um, 
uh, the overhang. What are, what are we calling the um, canopies? Canopies. What's the word we're using for that? Over the, the doors. Pro the proposed would be canopies. Yeah. Um, I just I'd like to tell the developers to be sure to check the zoning ordinance with the code enforcement officer because um, I don't know that we actually have to just check out the signage regulations. I don't have the latest version of them in front of me. Um, it, just to be sure you don't have to go in and get a variance for a different type of sign. I, I, I would make the argument that this is a different type of building and, you know, whatever canopy you need, you need. <laughs> so, uh, but just check with him. And then I, if every, has everybody spoken yet, Patrick? Yes, except any abutters that we would have. Uh, Curtis also has his hand up to yeah. say something as well. Um, because I would like to talk about the rear elevation. Okay. Do you mind if we jump to Curtis real quick? It's, I assume it's relevant to the current discussion. Yeah, Curtis, I was just going go to echo, echo what Julie was saying about the, uh, I feel that to require a residential um, building to maintain a signboard is an undue burden on them for something that doesn't have a purpose. I do echo my earlier comments that I would like to consider that it's a reuse of the historical character, maybe more appropriate to have those letters on the front. Try it out, see how it looks. I don't know because they're kind of a tall letter maybe it doesn't work maybe it does um the other my other comment is i still would encourage the use of sdl as it is permitted by um nps national park service in historic preservation it just seems the appropriate use for me thank you All right, um, with that, let's go back to Julie uh, for additional comments about the rear of the building. Yeah, I, um, I understand what's happening with the rear of the building, you know, going residential and whatever space is gonna be used on the below, uh, below street level. Um, and I did have the, the actual drawings of the uh, rear present well. Um, I did want to know why the one that's at street level is so much larger, hanging out so much larger. That's a little troubling to me, but it's, again, a point of view I don't know that people will see. But then I took a look at the, the Photoshop version of the rear, and and maybe it's the, the uh, time of day or the angle of the photo, but the, the feeling of the solid to void, uh, to me, it has become overwhelming, overwhelmingly void. Um, so it makes that heavy building feel a little, to me, um, not tenuous, but I don't know. And I'd like to hear the other commissioner's opinion about that. Um, because it, that was my first instinct was that, wow, there's nothing left of the building back there. Okay. I believe that the street level balcony is a further projection out from the other two floors above. Um, Adam or any of the, the applicants, can you speak to that? Yeah, there are a couple things to speak to there. Yes, you are correct that the balcony um, here, the first level extends a little bit further. Uh, you commented about this opening here, I believe. And what that is, is it's actually the opening of masonry at the rear of the fly loft. And instead of infilling that with brick, um, we were proposing to take the bump out off and replace that um, with a glass opening and somehow allow that to be seen from this uh, interior space, whether it becomes retail or commercial, um, it becomes a little bit more of a, a space, if you will, that's not located in, in somebody's housing unit. Um, so that was the approach there. Uh, as, as for the other openings, again, we have one punched opening um, in each of the units here, a sliding glass door 
in each of the units here. Um, so aside from this big move, which is already a masonry opening in the building, um, the punched openings are somewhat limited. Yeah, I understand that, and and I appreciate what you're doing. Um, and you have the available space to make that big uh, open piece of you know the big glass area where that whatever warp <laughs> was located. Um, it, it's not really. I, I, I'm not describing it well. What ha what happens between the balconies on the residential units? Is there, it, they, there's a space between them. There's a brick. Uh, the original wall comes down between them. If you understand. Oh, space in here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm pointing at my screen. <laughs> um, between uh, between the two units. I think vertically, Adam. Right down the middle. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Is that so, just a flat wall? That's just flat wall. So somewhere in here, there's going to be a demising wall between this unit and this unit. Right. And so that wall lands in there somewhere. Um, and so the, it, it really wouldn't make sense to have any more openings there. No, I'm not looking for more openings. Okay. <laughs> You're not. I think so. No, I, I, I have no solution. I just think that the, uh, I think it's the balconies that are getting in the way because in this, in this Photoshop thing, they look like they're receding into the space as opposed to projecting. Um, so I'll, I'll just have to cogitate on that. I, that may just be my dilemma here. Julie, Julie, you're seeing the heavy shadow as void. The heavy shadow. Yeah. I, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I think that's a slight misrepresentation. Um, maybe we can get a better sun angle on that rendering to lighten that up a little bit. Well, someday uh, it will look like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, in our weather. But that's fine. Okay, that's good. I assume there's some sort of brackets that are going to hold up the balcony unless you're tying back into existing structure somehow. So not existing structure, new structure. So the building doesn't currently have a third floor. Um, so there will be new structure that will have to poke out of the building to support those decks. Okay, thank you. And they will be cantilevered. That's what you're saying. Right. There's no brackets or cables to be tying them back. Hasn't been fully engineered yet, but that would not be our approach. Our approach would be that that we could um, bring steel right out through the building and cantilever them. Okay. Um, so one other piece that I think we would just want to see a little bit more detail on as the aesthetic and, and uh, Gwen was starting to ask about this, what, what are the railings themselves? And, and you did speak to uh, what you were proposing as the code compliance for those. But um, if you could just provide more detail on that, that'd be great. Sure. All right. Um, Julie, you still have your hand raised. Any additional comments? Are you good? Mr. John, I'm just a little lazy on that. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, and, yes. Mr. Chairman, um, yes. Uh, before you go into the public hearing, would it be possible for me to say a couple of comments, uh, or would you prefer that I wait until after the public hearing? Um, I just want to respond to some of the comments about the marquee. Yeah. I, well, right now, I don't see any hands raised, and I just see zero attendees. Uh, okay. So I don't believe there's going to be any public comment. Okay. Um, so go ahead. Well, thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, kind of follow up on some of the discussion that took place a moment ago between the various commission members. Um, I think that um, I think that the, in terms of the the existence or the lack of the existence of the marquee, that this needs to be viewed in in the context of of, of balancing uh, issues and needs and and obligations of the various parties. The the marquee itself, as has been noted both by Adam Wagner and also by a couple of the other commissioners just now, um, th there's no um, operational need for it because this, unlike some of the examples that you quoted, 
um, is not going to be part of a an operating theater or performing arts center, anything like that anymore. <clears throat> it's being converted to residential and or office and commercial space. So so the the the, the existence, the, the the need for the marquee has simply gone away. It's it's its purpose in life has, has ended. Um, in connection with the sale of this property. Um, there was a mention um, as well that there could be some potential need for it because it has been serviced or it has been providing informational uh, messages and whatnot to the community. I don't think that that's our obligation to continue that to the extent that that ever did occur. I mean, it really only took place from my memory and I've been in Exeter working for about 20 years now. I don't live here. I have to confess. I live in one of the towns nearby, but um, it's only been since the uh, theater ended as a theater and was picked up by the, I believe the owner that just sold it to my clients um, that you would see the occasional commentary about uh, a concert here or a picnic there or, or whatever. Um, so I think that to the extent that the prior owner may have elected to do that, that is certainly not incumbent upon my clients to carry on with that obligation and to keep the marquee up in order to do that. Um, and I frankly don't think it's within, that's not part of the historical preservation purview of this board. Um, finally, and I, I have to confess, I haven't taken a close look at the letter that came in today from the um, the the fellow that looked at that has expertise in signage but it it didn't look promising to me at all um in terms of the ability to restore this and again i think if you, if you think of the balance of 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 what could possibly be provided or the service that would be provided to the community as compared to the um by saving it as opposed to the to the extreme obligations imposed upon my clients I, I just don't think that it's 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 really an issue. Um, I think that the my my people and the and the design team I think have done an extraordinary job of trying to literally take apart the elements of that marquee and the signage that's associated with it and essentially reconstruct it, but do it in a way we listened to the commission the last time in which there was there was dissatisfaction expressed about the fact that we were trying to sort of. Um, replicate in kind of a fake or a false way, if you will, um, the, the marquee and create it anew. This time, what we've done is that we've kept that same line of the canopy. And, and obviously, we can listen to whatever comments that you have about the, the, the nature or the style of the canopy, whatever, but it is still there. And, and as well, the signage is there, still there. So in short, I, I would encourage the commission to, and I think the, the, the majority of the speakers that I'm hearing tonight like what we've done with the canopy and like what we've done with the, with the lettering, you know, we're certainly, we can talk and tweak about both of those things, but I would encourage the commission to move on from that point and, and hopefully seek either an approval or at least some uh, solid direction so that we can get to an approval fairly quickly. So thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I see no attendees, uh, but I will ask for the formal um, the formal obligations of the meeting. Are there any abutters? Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak in support or against the application as we see it? All right, uh, hearing none. Um, I'm going to ask for any additional comments from any of the commission members at this point. Um, I believe that we've got a lot of information in front of us and I'd like to have a general discussion and consensus about whether we feel we can proceed in at least accepting the application as complete for the material that we need uh, are there any outstanding items or pieces that we need before we would have the proper information needed for a either denial or, or approval of the application? So uh, I won't call anyone call on anyone in particular, but uh, uh, go ahead if, uh, if there's comments about that from commission members. Uh, Julie and Curtis, have your hands up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before we... Uh, I talk about anything more, any more information I want. I just wanted to remind the commission members, and and this is also for Attorney Summers, that we're not we're finding something that's that we're we're deciding on whether the treatment of this building is appropriate to the district, not 
that we like it or not. So I just want to remind the commission members to uh, think in that manner as opposed to does it look better now than it did before. Um, and I had another question, but I've forgotten it since, so I will lower my hand. All right, uh, Curtis. Uh, yes, my comments were that I don't feel like the question is whether or not the existing canopy can be preserved. Of course, it can be preserved. That's not the point. I, I think the question is, should it be preserved? And with that, I'd like to make a differentiation between a marquee and a signboard the signboard is absolutely not necessary. I agree with legal counsel um, that it's not something that needs to be on a residential building. And if I, I'm going to repeat my opinion that it would be an undue burden for a residential building to maintain a signboard, a marquee, which is the sign outside of a theater, that preservation, I'm still promoting preservation of those letters. And that's all I have. Okay. Um, let's see. Julie has her hand back up again. Julie, go ahead. You remembered what you were going to say? Um, no, I don't remember what I was going to say before, but I've got something new. Are we? Are we um, are we going right into the public hearing? Is this our, is this the formal? Is the application complete, or are we going to have an, one more uh, workshop before we do the formal? I'm asking for a general discussion on that amongst commission members right now. We don't have, as a public hearing, there is no other um, outside voices right now. We can close the public hearing at this point because there is no other abutters uh, or any other information coming from the from the residents or public. And we can have a general discussion discussion amongst ourselves as commission members and ask any additional questions that we need. If there's information that we still believe is outstanding that we would need to make a complete application, I want to talk about that now before we make any motions to proceed. Well, I think that was my question is what we're talking about here, actually making the decision and the motion of whether this application is complete or not. At this point, I mean, the applicants and the architects have gone through great extents in terms of providing all of this information. I don't see any reason in delaying them an additional month just because um, if if someone was looking to speak on this matter, either for or against, uh, they would have been here last month or this month. And um, so I, I don't see any reason in, in having the undue burden of delaying them an additional month, unless it is their choice, um, or uh, we as commission members feel that we need additional information. No, I, ha I have no problem with that. I just want to be clear on the, on the process. Okay. So I will open it up to any council or any commission members. Is there any additional information that we would need at this time? I wouldn't mind a railing detail of what the actual proposed uh, railing. I, it looks like a horizontal slat railing, four inch on center. Um, I just don't know if it's a aluminum rail, steel rail painted black um okay so that is a good one um another one would be the the detailed window openings that we had talked about um the brick mold you did show us and how you're going to address that at the jams would be nice to see in terms of the recess from the facade also how those are going to be terminating on a subsill uh, above the the existing masonry openings um and head details that would be uh that would be great to see um the the roof structure on the top to the pergola and the designs behind that uh, we like the idea of that but i don't believe there's any specific details on uh materials or uh, connections or fastenings or anything like that so that detail i guess it would, we're, we're, we're getting into the details i guess in terms of completing the application Um, 
and we did not see anything about the manufacturer for the sliding doors in the back. And the large opening that is the existing flyway opening, masonry opening now, it looks in elevation as it's just a, and maybe it's my screen, but it looks like it's a just a void right now. And you were saying that that would be a glass, glass opening. Uh, yeah, so in, in elevation, proposed elevation, river uh, front elevation number four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. some more clarity on what that is representing. Uh, I'd also ask uh, more detail about the preservation of the IOCA letters from the signage, whether those will be um, lit or not. Jeremy, can I just address that uh, request? Sure. So the existing letters are not UL listed and would never be UL listed. So we might be able to illuminate the letters from a different standpoint, but it wouldn't be the actual letters themselves. The, yeah, the, the previous were neon, uh, old neon, which is not uh, used nowadays uh, for, for various reasons. So, but LEDs or anything like that, um, you wouldn't be. You're, you're saying you wouldn't be replacing the neon within the sign that's or within the letters themselves. You would use a different application for sign, signage lighting. Yes. Okay. So then, if that would be a, a surface mounted or a facade mounted down light or something like that, or an up light, um, a cut sheet on that light would be would be great to have. Okay, makes sense. Um, I guess just the uh, the defi final proposal on the simulated divided lights versus authentic divided lights, and just taking into account our comments on those. Well, that's that's what I can think of right now. Uh, commission members, is there anything else? that I may have missed. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would also like to um, have uh, be able to do a little research, I guess, on those um, true divided lights versus the simulated divided lights. I had somebody else, some, some other commissioner um, spoke about not, it doesn't have to be that wide and, you know, saving the energy on the floors above and having the simulated divided lights above um, will do a lot for um for the apartments and and what have you up there but um i think something can be done on the first floor that is not that is true divided lights uh without losing um all that uh space on the panes okay yeah there's certainly options uh for interior energy panels and things like that that wouldn't necessarily take away from those fixed door panels being used as storefronts in the future for advertising um, product. Um, okay, great. Anything else? Uh, Doug, Pam, Gwen? Raise my <laughs> hand. <laughs> I, I, my hand is covered by part of the uh, application here. Uh, I mean, I'm seeing there's quite a few things here that don't meet the building code and as they get into design further, I mean, the railings, for instance, are a glaring example where you can't have climbable railings that high. But as they start working on the details, it, I think we should cut this thing loose at some point and let them start detailing and then have a second look at I mean, how, how, how articulated the canopy becomes, I think is an interesting question, but it shouldn't be something, I mean, do, do we have to like accept this as it is now because it's gonna change? Um, that's, that's the point of what I'm asking right now in this discussion. Okay. The, 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 the details that we're looking to approve as historically appropriate for the building and ultimately is like, is 
the best representation of what we would like to see built uh, to be historically appropriate. So you're correct in saying if things are going to change after the fact, then it's not uh, something we want to cut loose uh, per se. Yeah, I hate to get into a long discussion about uh, railings when they can't even do that kind of a railing. And and the other issue with the uh, access and egress off of the front doors, we don't even know uh, what the zoning code will allow with that whole situation. So, yeah, I think we we could paint a kind of a broad brush picture of what and I and I like what I'm seeing here. I I, I think that this is a good place to start. But it'd be nice to have a second look at some of these details later on. Yeah. Well, us asking for those details would mean right now that they were coming back next month with that information, with their best proposed option for those items detailed, and then we can take a a look at them. At that point, point, if we were to proceed with an approval, uh, if something was to change after that approval, they could come back and just say, hey, we got into this a little bit. This can't be the way that we had proposed. We wanted it to be. Um, this is our. This is the revision to that proposal, without holding up the original approval, or delaying the original approval. Um, so, that said, uh, definitely we would like to see more more of the finite details. I guess is what we're saying. Sort of a design development set. Yeah. Pam? You good, Pam? I'm fine. Should we move to accept and then let them do their thing and then do the approve, which is what we usually do? Well, if we accept the application, that means we have enough information to make a determination and approval. I think that's what we're not. We're saying we want to see those extra details at this point. Okay, fine. I'd, I'd much rather do all in the same meeting, an acceptance of the information that we have to then make a uh, binding approval or disapproval on. So. Well, we're not approving, we're just accepting. They're two different things. I understand. I'd like to do both of those in the same meeting, accept mm-hmm. and uh, the next step in, this, in the same meeting. Patrick, I think that, I think you're right because what I've heard here is enough questions that we need one more look at this with uh, the other details that um, every, like, as Doug said, there there are things that we still want to know about. So, right. you know, we're we're in the design stage. I understand the pain of the owners and the developers and the and the architects. That um, you know, can we go forward some more? But I think for our process, for our process, we just want to make sure we want we need to be sure that um, what is going to be there is what is going to be there. Um, We've done conditional approvals before, but I think we have too many uh, things on the list still uh, to do a conditional approval. So I agree with you that I'd like to do the, uh, accept the application as complete and then go, then do the public hearing and decide on the project at, at one meeting. Yes. Um, if we accept the application now, then it's on the information we currently have. And right. we're asking for more information right now. So it's not, um, we're, we're deeming it not necessarily complete at this point. So let's do that um, and have it come back with the finite details for that. Um, at that point, any further discussions that we'll need to have and take place on those details will happen. And then hopefully we can make uh, two motions and um move to accept and take the next step at the next meeting. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just for the record, I just I just want to make sure that we have our marching orders correctly from everything I'm he- I'm hearing tonight and I guess I would I would just ask for confirmation of this that in terms of the broad brush approach that we presented tonight in terms of the rooftops and the 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 post canopy and the the um, reuse of the letters and so forth on a conceptual level, all of that is 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 something that the the the, um, the commission finds to be appropriate, and so that we don't need to go back to the drawing board in terms of any kind of major design issues at this point, as I understand it. And we're just I want to get confirmation of this. What we're doing is to provide to you the level of details that you need to be in. Then at the next meeting. Um, 
make a definitive indication that you have all the information that you need and that you can then make a decision. Is that correct? That's that's a correct interpretation. Uh, I think the overall design and the concept is favorable. Uh, let, let's, let's put it that way, um, as opposed to any binding language. Um, it's favorable in the sense that we're not asking to go back to the drawing board with any major broad strokes or any major elements okay. of redesign. Okay. Okay. Um, we're asking for the finite so that we've got um, what we hope to see built uh, when hopefully approved for being historically appropriate. Um, at this point, uh, we, we truly appreciate the fact that these have been more work based, uh, work session based and discussion based as opposed to um, trying to cross all the T's and dot all the I's in one meeting. It's been very helpful for us. And now that we are not making you do um, an abundance of redesign and major element rework, um, we're just taking it to that final step, asking for those final Understood. details. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, with that, I would all the public hearing is um, somewhat ended. There was no public comment. So I'm going to end the public hearing on uh, this application um, at this point and uh, move to table it to the next meeting. And we will have returned the finite details that have been requested. Does the applicant at this point want to review what we've requested just as a final checklist with us? Um, I think it would be prudent maybe to make sure that everything's complete the next round. Yes. All right. It's... Uh, All right. <clears throat> Commission members, is, has anyone, was anyone taking a running list of that? If not, I can do a reiteration. I bet Curtis has it. Okay. I have the uh, railing material and details, pergola details, sliding door details, the large opening, whether that's a storefront or unit glazing in the back. Um, preservation of lettering and lighting of the lettering. Okay. Um, and then simulated divided light, I think was a simulated divided light versus authentic divided light was the final piece. Yes, that's correct. I'd, I'd add uh, detail oh, no. canopy. Yeah. Canopy details. Okay, thanks, Doug. Okay. Julie, was there anything else? No, uh, somebody said it, so I'm all set. Okay. Uh, and oh, Christina? Actually, actually, I wanted to say um, for the uh, true divided lights, uh, if we're all uh, um, have a consensus, I'm only talking about the first floor. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I, th I would recommend, you know, uh, coming back with what your proposal is and any potential options so we can kind of talk to those and, um, you know, we'll, we'll come to it. We can come to a consensus on that uh, next month. Uh, Christina, you had your hand raised. I did, Mr. Chairman. I just I had the same running list uh, that you had. I just want to make sure we have all our ducks in a row, but I also had um, detailed window openings, the sub sill head. Yes, um, thank you. And those details. So I have eight all together. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anything else? And Mr. Chair? Yes. Gwen, um, I don't know if this is getting into the details we don't need to get into, but I really liked your idea of the spacer bar and the simulated divided lights. Is that mm -hmm. something that's appropriate to have them follow up on, or is the other are the other commissioners um, in favor of that? I believe they had that circled on the uh, plan as what they had, were proposing. Oh, okay. I I was I didn't I didn't understand that. I was thinking that that was something that. Um, 
Patrick had had mentioned and that it was a thought that he had I didn't I didn't realize that it was on the on the plan itself so that's my my mistake it was it was shown in a line drawing as having it in the detail and then in the graphic image it showed it without so i was just asking for clarity on what what the proposal is asking for all right great one one or the other and And, uh Oh. recommending the preference of using the space bar. Uh, go ahead, Gwen. Okay. And then my other question was, there have been a couple um, people have mentioned um, just going on site. Is that something you would do after the next meeting? Or is that something that you are thinking of following up on? When when would that, in, in the process, when would that take place? I think it was look, to look at brick colors or Mm -hmm. that so so that was specifically the comment i had made last month about the reuse of new or not the reuse uh the use of new brick yeah and matching that to the existing um in this application they had said that there would be enough of brick from punched openings and new windows to actually reuse the existing brick so in that respect i have no issue with needing to see anything Okay. in terms of new brick right. used uh, but uh, if 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 we are so lucky to be invited out to site I'm sure uh, plenty of us would 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 happily uh, go along with that okay great thank you you're all very welcome to uh, have a site walkthrough we can okay. that. great um, is that something that we would like to set up before the next meeting it should be done before the next meeting yes okay so then uh let us collectively as commission members try to find a date that works and that or or a few dates that work and then propose those to the applicants sure okay we'll do that offline um uh, christina you had your hand up again or is that still up from earlier okay all right um so i at this point, I think we can close uh, the public hearing and um, we will be happy to see a complete application next week, um, next month. So thank you very much for all the work you've put into this. Thank you also. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Free, free to go grab some dinner if you have not already. All right, for commission members, we have nothing else under new business or public hearings for this meeting. Under other business, we do have a few items. Um, The first is State Commission for Coastal Resilience and Economic Development Program as detailed in SB 285. And I believe that was put on here by Julie, if I had to guess. Julie, did you want to speak to that? (laughs) I don't think I put it on this month's agenda, but I might have put it on like a year ago. Um, This is a bill that was passed uh, in 2019 and it is establishing, uh, the title is rather deceptive. Uh, It's about coastal resilience and economic economic development. Um, But the gist of it is really uh, coastal uh, resilience and historic preservation. And to, and you'll see it somewhere to include the cemeteries um, or burial sites. Um, but what it does is allows for, it actually establishes a commission and the commission's goal is to uh, create some rules of uh, for municipalities to actually join together and like some towns have villages within the town uh, to make a, a preservation kind of district. So if we share land with um, Stratum and Stratum's got a cemetery that's within the uh, uh, floodplain and they want to disinter and, and move, then maybe Exeter has a place nearby that we can put it. So we join the two towns together to create a, a preservation district. Uh, it's, it's considering things like that. So in making this commission, there are, I don't know, a bazillion, almost 20 people on the on the committee, if not more. And one of them is a, a, a member from the Historic District Commission from each town. 
uh, one is a member, a person from each town. I don't know if that means a select board member or just anyone. Um, and I'm on this commission as a state rep. Um, the, and, and I'll tell you that the commission hasn't met yet because uh, the first meeting was canceled and the second meeting, the state house was closed. So we had to cancel that one too. Um, so there's been no assemblage of people. Um, I'm not sure how to go about appointing somebody from the historic district commission to be on this unknown commission. <laughs> but I would like to know if anybody's interested. The meetings will most likely be held in Concord. There will probably, given the size of the commission, uh, be subcommittees to deal with the different aspects. Um, so I would encourage you, I don't, you don't need to give me an answer right now if this is like lighting a fire in your head or something, but if you uh, would take the, take the next month to, to read this piece of legislation and think about it and whether you might be interested in being a representative from Exeter. Okay. Um, do you mind emailing us the link to it or I can do the that document? Right. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. We will dis discuss that. Uh, discussion on the demolition review process is the next item on other business. Yeah. Did I put that on there too? I believe so. <laughs> Well, one of the things that the Heritage Commissions, uh, one of their duties is to review um, proposed demolition of buildings, but it doesn't, doesn't just include buildings, it includes uh, appurtenances. So if you read uh, Zoning Ordinance 5.3.2, 5 is the demolition review process that Marquis is going to have to go through that demolition process. And one of the things that the Heritage Commission has struggled with is at what point does that review come in the process of a project going forward? And in keeping in mind that, that the Demolition Review Committee and Heritage Commission have no regulatory authority. They Julia froze on us. Ah, I told you I had the, uh, that better? Can you hear me now? Yep, yep. Um, we have no regulatory authority, so we're only advisory to the property owner and the other boards that will be considering the project. And um, we have never, well, Pam, you can correct me, <laughs> hardly ever uh, been in a place where we could recommend uh, demolition or preservation before a project has gone ahead to either the zoning board or the planning board. And at that point, the applicant assumes they have whatever they need because we're only, we can only recommend. And I'm saying we because I, I, I sit on the Heritage Commission too. Yeah. So, so we're having a problem getting that point across to, uh, I wanted to talk about it to this board, um, when there's a demolition involved like this one. And, you know, it's the emotional one. I think we did really well tonight um, talking about a marquee versus sign board and what it is. Um, but maybe we should have heard from the demolition review committee first. Um, they deal with the heritage of the town, the history, um, might have had a different feeling about the marquee. Uh, we have, uh, and, and, well, two architects and, and then people that with Pam with the historical background and, and other people who are just interested in keeping our town's heritage uh, as protected. Um, so... I guess I want to ask your help for when we get an application like this to um, cons to suggest to our planning and building department to forward it on to the uh, demolition review committee first. And the the if when you read the zoning ordinance, the committee has a very short time period to consider a project and get back to the property owner on their opinion. So it wouldn't cause. Uh, in, depending on the timing of the application, it shouldn't cause a delay in an application to the HDC if that was involved or planning board if that was involved. Um, I, th I think if, if we need to make a recommendation of the zoning ordinance to make that 
um, additional an additional piece of our checklist to have that letter of that letter from the demolition review committee as part of the application um, when it when it presents itself. I mean, it, it's very similar to the letters of support that we received tonight for re the removal of the of the marquee. Um, demolition review committee might have a differing opinion and it would have a differing um, expert opinion as an advisory board that knows a lot more about the history of the town and the heritage of the town and more of that intangibles of what that marquee would actually mean to the town as opposed to just serving the new function of the building but yeah i would appreciate that i think do we have to i, I don't recall do we have to have public hearings if, uh, if we uh, amend our um application no we have to read it we don't have to have public hearings, but we have to le legally read it three times before it becomes adopted. Yep. And in each of those, we have to read it in a public hearing, in a public setting, and allow come in question. Okay. So, at a minimum, it would take three months. <laughs> <laughs> well, three months is better than never, so. <laughs> yeah. I, would I, don't, I don't disagree. I mean, that... Uh, for me, that would be a great piece of information to have whenever there is a significant element that's up for demolition that has significant historic significance. Um, that would be a great document to have as part of the application. Is what, what we're looking at is the, the uh, what's called the historical resources of the town. Every building, every um, uh, view, what's the word, view? Well, anyway, scenic view. Streetscape. Uh, thank you. Not streetscape, but just a view, a view, uh, viewscape. Uh, like just looking down the river. It doesn't have to be, you know, would it damage the heritage of the town to add a resource that is a brand new bridge somewhere down, down river from uh, String Bridge? Um, I have an idea about that, though. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so what we're looking at and, and our experience has been, say, for the building uh, next door to the town office building that has the um, new units that are being built out by the parking lot. Um, we were the last body to see any part of that building, and they were only taking off a piece of the building, you know, it, and so it was our opinion that it didn't need to come down and that it made more. It was a bigger resource to the history of that building and the shape of the building and the growth of the building. You're talking about 12 Front Street? Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Um, mm. So we came up with a good compromise uh, in their design. But again, we were the last people to see. Mm. So, that, yeah. I, I mean, I, th I think that it would be a great um it would be a great piece of information to have in the applications where it where that would apply so yes i'd like to move forward on what we would need to do to either amend the zoning ordinance or our checklist to um, include that yeah it's not a it's not a zoning ordinance change um i don't, I don't think process it would be a um rules and procedure for uh, every land use board, depending on, you know, the planning board might want to change their rules or procedure to say, uh, does the building have demolition? Uh, let's add that, to, you know, let's add to our rules of procedure that if a, if a proposal has demolition, it must go to the Heritage Commission first, which actually says so in the zoning ordinance, but doesn't have to. I was just going to ask if there is a, uh, a line chart in terms of the specific land use boards and what, because we've come into applications that have already have planning board approval, and then they're coming to the HDC. We, we, you know, we've had that in the past, the chicken before the egg type right. of thing. Um, what, what, it, what does the current zoning ordinance say in terms of that process, or is it undefined? Um, it it says that if a building, if a project that goes to uh, an application to the planning board or, or other land use board uh, proposes demolition, then it's supposed to come to the demolition review committee first. Mm. Okay. Good. And this has been, uh, my voice has not been 
I've been the lone voice for a long time on this, so I would appreciate a little help on that. Okay. All right. Uh, outside of demolition review, there is no process in terms of planning board first, HDC second, zoning board no. third. We've really tried to, no, we've tried to do, um, it comes out of the planning and building, they kind of make that choice of what is the biggest need in order for a project to proceed. Um, and we've tried to do flow charts and uh, with a past planner and, and uh, did not agree on <laughs> which way the process would go. Uh, you know, we did one of those if yes, you know, if this, then go here. Um, it just kind of died on the vine. Everything has to go through planning board, right? Everything does. So yes. uh, they might as well be less, right? I mean, if it's in, if it's within the historic district commission, if the structure is within any of the districts, we should see it first, right? Is that doesn't that make any lot? Doesn't that just make logical sense? Yep, we've had that. Uh, the only place that we really have the big argument is when somebody has to go to the zoning board, and you can make the argument that they can't show us a design if they don't know they can use, make the do the use that they want to do. Somebody's changing the use of a, of a structure. So that's where it sometimes gets decidedly fuzzy because right. you know, and a, a developer wants to know what they can do and then then we have to know how they can do it. Um, so does it go, so it goes to ZBA and then planning board and then oh, we happen to be the lucky ones that are left with whatever footprint there is. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, I don't know. We can probably try to talk about that process a little little more, or at least have a heads up from zoning board. Or it could be, well, it could be, um, I don't know if they even know about it. I, it. Probably one of those things we talked about in an all boards meeting of having a representative from HDC and Heritage Commission just go introduce themselves to the other boards because that's never really formally worked out. Yeah, right. Okay. And maybe I'll go to every meeting every month and uh, next month. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. I guess we're done with that. That one in terms of a topic for now. Thank you for listening. Okay. Um, other business, the approval of the minutes from May 21st, 2020. Um, I will open it up to anyone to talk about revisions needed. Or those, please. Okay, I have uh, page two, about one third of the way down. The sentence starts with, he will also be talking about something that are existing now and they do not believe are historic to the building and they would actually like to bring it back to its original Granger. Should be Granger, G R A N D E U D E U R. Okay, let's see that. Okay, any others? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> what was that whistle? <laughs> That's a comment ability. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is right or not in, in the first page, uh, the second line. Is it RSA 91A2? I, I was listening to the your introduction tonight, and I happened to be looking at the minutes while you were doing that. Oh, and it yes, it is like a... a. <laughs> It is A2, not A2. Not A2, okay. Um, here, and then on page three, second line, uh, I think it's aesthetic, A-E-S-T-H-E-T-I-C. Uh, what page? Uh, the third page, I'm sorry. Third page. Third page, second line. Page, yes, correct. Aesthetic. And then marquee uh, throughout, it's on many pages. Um, it should have two E's. That starts on the third page, okay. second paragraph, but it's, there are countless marquees. <laughs> okay. Um, 
and then I don't know. That may be. I think that was it for me. All right. Any others? Julie, Pam, Doug. Would it be possible to get a, a Microsoft Word version of this so we could spell check it? <laughs> spell we... checking does not work on this at all. <laughs> no? No. Why not? Because you, this was just spell checked and it came out like that. Oh, okay. We should have seen what we got for Munton. <laughs> <laughs> Mutton chops. Mutton chops. <laughs> Well, Mr. Chair, I would make a motion to uh, approve the minutes of our May 15th. May 21st. May 21st meeting minutes uh, as amended. All second. right. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? <laughs> Bill Curtis, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Roll call. Aye. Roll Aye. call. Roll call. Roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. Roll call, yes. <laughs> Julie? Aye. Pam? Aye. Curtis. Aye. Gwen. Aye. Doug. Aye. Myself, Patrick. Aye. So approved as noted. That's kind of like how it is at the House of Representatives. Everybody's sitting ready to do a voice vote and somebody stands up and says, roll call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crazy times we're in. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone for taking the time to be a part of this commission and for this meeting. That concludes what I have on the agenda. If there isn't anything else, then I will make a motion to adjourn. It was a good meeting, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everyone. And I'm right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your comments.